And we'll, we'll wrap up. Hope everybody got, uh, got some good sandwiches and, and snacks there on the break. And uh, generally, just thanks for, for your continued participation throughout the day. Um, it's, it's awesome to see that the room has, has stayed pretty full throughout the day, so, so thank you. Um, before I, I introduce our, our final keynote, I just want to give a, a quick shout out and thanks to, to Joe Costa at the back been doing our tech for the day. So thank you very much, Joe. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so for our final keynote of the day, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Mr. Dwight Duncan. Dwight Duncan worked in government for almost 25 years, including as uh, uh, Ontario's Deputy Premier, Minister of Finance, Chair of the Management Board of Cabinet, Chair of Cabinet, Government House Leader, Minister of Energy, Minister of Revenue, Minister of Government Services, House Leader. Uh, he had ministerial responsibility for Ontario Securities Commission, Energy Board, Ontario Lottery and Gaming Corporation, Liquor Control Board, uh, Hydro One, Ontario Power Generation. Uh, and then as finance minister, he delivered six budgets, uh, led reforms related to tax, pension, insurance, energy, um, and helped out uh, the province's response to the economic recession in 2008. Uh, being elected, he served six years as a councillor in the city of Windsor. Uh, and he holds undergraduate degree in economics from McGill uh, and an MBA uh, and honorary doctorate of laws from the University of Windsor. Uh, he serves on several uh, corporate and nonprofit boards, and he's also a member of the Macmillan L LLP. Thank you very much, Dwight. What all those things mean is I couldn't keep a job. Um, first of all, Tom, thank you for having me. I didn't realize you got your start with the late, great Walter Gordon. Um, and what a, what a remarkable Canadian. And uh, it's, a, it's an honor for me as a liberal finance minister, albeit at the provincial level, to, to have been invited to speak here. And uh, I speak I've never had the privilege of knowing, uh, knowing him, but he certainly had an impact on my thinking growing up and uh, on, on many Canadians. And he was part, in my view, of, you know, Mr. Pearson's government achieved so much in, in a very short period of time and never with a majority government. I mean, it's just a, an astounding period in our country's history. first speech I wrote for Mr. Gordon, Mr. Pearson almost asked him to leave cabinet the next day. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it, they were tremendous trailblazers and uh, did many great things for this country. Um, you know, I had, you know, I, I, I laughed at Gary's story uh, and about how people keep politicians humble. I had a, a similar experience. Uh, I was invited to do the kickoff speech at a, a local elementary school's UNICEF assembly one fall. Remember in the old days, they used to clean for UNICEF when they went trick or treating. <laughs> And the young, young woman, I think she was in seventh or eighth grade, who introduced me, she introduced me, and I gave my remarks, and I had just joined the Ontario cabinet, and I was feeling pretty not humble, let's put it that way. But this young woman had a great way to bring me right back to reality. She gets up to thank me, and she says, Mr. Duncan, I want to thank you. We had originally invited Bozo the Clown. He couldn't come. <laughs> True story. <laughs> Absolutely true story. So, so I, uh, you know, as as John uh, as John said, I I served, I gave delivered six provincial budgets. I served nine years in cabinet, but the three most interesting years I was in were my time at energy. I said to Brad earlier, and I, I said to John McGrath, who unfortunately couldn't stay, was he was uh, at Queens Park CBC bureau. And he was one of a group of journalists we called the energy geeks. They knew energy inside out and backwards. And they read every obscure document. And they were able to really do a good job in holding us to account at an important time in our history. And it was interesting. Even after I became finance minister, I would travel, you know, do post-budget road shows in various financial centers around the world. And inevitably, the questions would come back to energy because um, we often forget our role as Canadians and, and, and what, you know, what makes our country in some ways great and what makes it, what gives it challenges. And so I'm going to start off by my, my dear friend Brad, uh, Gary, and the other politicians didn't do, and I'm going to answer the questions you asked. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, <Shot>. so... <laughs> 
And by the way, I, I'm going to I'm going to encourage you to challenge me on anything I say because, uh, you know, as finance minister, you you spend your life being the skunk at the garden. Um, you're always the one who says no. You're always the one who questions everything, and you you really do have to have, there can't be an, an inch of daylight between you and the First Minister, as I'm sure there wasn't between Mr. Gordon and Mr. Pearson. And uh, so I, I, I'm going to try to go at it from that perspective. A lot of what I put in, in the presentation has been touched on. I'm going to, and I've, I've made some adjustments. So first of all, we will not achieve our goals by uh, 2030. We're not even close. Nobody in the world is. Um, unless there's a kid sitting out in a garage somewhere inventing fusion or inventing some new thing that nobody's even dreamed of, 2050s, it's a legislative mandated target, which it is now in Canada, it ain't happening for a whole variety of reasons. And I don't say that as a criticism of governments, because you know there's nothing wrong with a government that sets ambitious goals and then sets about achieving them. Um, I'm going to ask politicians, before I ask, politicians always want to be President Kennedy at Rice University. Can any of the young people in this room tell me what the Rice University speech was? We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they... Because they're hard. <laughs> exactly. I'm glad to hear that. Most young people... <laughs> And by the way, if you want some real inspiration, go and see that speech. It's, it's available on YouTube, and uh, it, it's, it, it speaks to what mankind can do when, when we set our minds to it. And I think that was probably the mindset of the, the 100 Days of Decision. And, and uh, every politician wants to be that guy. He doesn't want to be the guy that figures out how to get there. And it is not wrong to set ambitious goals and to lay out plans, and to not meet goals. Unfortunately, in the current political climate, we often get, if you miss a goal, I had to be the one to announce we weren't going to achieve the coal closure goal. I set it and I set the policy in play. I remember when Premier McGuinty in opposition formulated the policy, I wasn't paying close attention at the time. I mean, I'm one of those people, I get my I get my hydro bill, and I'm going to speak about hydro bills in a moment. I get my hydro bill, it just comes out of my bank account automatically, and I don't even look at it, right? I, I'm lucky. And so when he made this announcement, I had, at the time, eyes used to glaze over when you talked about energy policy, particularly in Ontario. <laughs> and then he makes me energy minister. <laughs> Six months after the blackout, with a with a a plan to close the coal plants by 2007, three years essentially. And that was the top of my mandate letter. And within about six weeks, I realized physically no way possible that we can do this. Absolutely none. And that someone, I suspect it was the natural gas industry, convinced us that we could, all we had to do was shut down the coal plants and uh, put up gas plants. I mean, that was the essence of the solution at the time, but minimum it takes five years to put up a gas plant in these. And we did, we did it. And, you know, somebody else, I think Gary mentioned about, you know, the just transition in Alberta. Let me tell you, one of those coal plants that we had to close was um, just northwest of Thunder Bay in a town called Atacokan. There were 100 people that worked in that coal plant. And just talking about closing it caused huge consternation. There was a wonderful mayor at the time who was one of those politicians who was optimistic. And, and he was relentless in lobbying our government. And I, went, I decided to go up to Atacokan. And it was the only time I served in public office that I felt my physical safety was... In, it, it threatened. And just talking about it forced the value of their properties down. I mean, we here in Eastern Canada have to be very sensitive 
to Western Canadian needs, we haven't been. A lot of jobs here in Ontario produce stuff that goes into the oil sands. People don't realize that. Natural gas, you know, when, like I say, back in the day when I was involved, natural gas was viewed as a very legitimate uh, substitution. Now, certain quarters are pushing even against that. Gary, I thought, addressed that very well. I'm not going to go into that at any length. Gas and oil are part of our future. There is no way, with based on current technologies, that we can get, and when that report came out on Monday, I've got a reference in the back so you can go look at it. You want to be scared. Go and have a look at it. But part of my talk is, was going to be about, you know, the challenges with kind of, whoops, kind of what it is we have to do and the challenges of getting to it. Tom kept coming back to federalism, and that is one of the biggest hindrances. I mean, I'm, there's speculation about an, an announcement in the, new, the next federal budget next week around a greater federal presence in, in production of electricity. I'd be interested to see how Albert, uh, Quebec responds to that. Let me tell you, we talked a little bit, Brad, when the question, when Tom raised the question about the, the east-west grid, he sounded like a Pearsonian liberal. And I say that with great affection because I spent the first year and a half of my time trying to get just that to happen. I went to northern Manitoba. We looked at the opportunities there. I went, we actually looked at the, the lower Churchill. We were prepared as a government to help develop that if we could get the power through Quebec and into Ontario and from northern Manitoba into southern Ontario. At the end of the day, as Brad indicated, it wasn't cost effective. And, and that's another thing we don't talk about enough. A couple people mentioned the question about the culture. You know, how much are people prepared to pay? Everybody talks a good game. But when it comes time to paying for it, look out. I saw an analysis from yesterday's Ontario budget that Ontario is now spending as much on energy subsidies as it is on long-term care, about $6 billion. And not only is that bad public policy, it's a disincentive. It's one of the things that that nice young fellow from Windsor, a lot of Windsor people here today, Tom, uh, who I'd never met before, and he was a brilliant presentation, he was talking about that policy that's contradictory. And the ability of those who don't progress to paint other policies that are very good and effective, undermining them, undermining public confidence. Second one I did, and Brad, I don't know how much of this you remember, but smart meters in Ontario. The opposition of the day criticized them as being tax machines. Well, first of all, energy is not paid for out of the tax system. There's, there's a base of energy pairs. And the old meters, which I'm sure some of you still have, the back of your house that you couldn't read, couldn't understand, and they didn't even measure the electricity well. So, of course, the Europeans, particularly the Italians, were light years ahead of us in that. Why? Because the price of electricity is so high there. And I went over, the, and Al invited me over. He's, that's the large, one of the large Italian transmitters and, and producers. And the problem they had in, in, <laughs> in Italy was if the smart meters went into one neighborhood, the next neighborhood over, the people were mad that they didn't get theirs. In Ontario, nobody wanted one. And, and that was one of those things, Brad, I, I didn't see that one coming. I mean, I, 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 you know, I saw price issues coming. I, I just thought, why wouldn't people want one of these things, right? But those are the kinds of issues that we have to constantly deal with and make sure that people understand them. And that is a difficult thing to do. Um, on the question of Canada's role in the international world, and, and you had a really good panel, there's not a lot I can add to them other than to say, and this is important, and this is why as a Canadian I'm optimistic, we are a net energy exporter. We got a lot of energy, 
And it's, the, our ability to produce has gone up in the last 10 years. What hasn't gone up is our ability to transport it and export it. We were talking about LNG uh, facilities 20 years ago when I became Ontario Energy Minister. 20 years ago. And prices and all that impact on the decisions and the viability of those things. So in the short term, we can't, we can't get LNG to Europe. It's very difficult. Hell, we can't even get pipeline. I do not get the debate around pipelines. I don't. I get the risk. I don't, myself, I'm not sure that it's not more risky to put oil and gas on trains and drive them through towns and villages. Not only here in Canada, look what happened just in Ohio two weeks ago. That to me is short-sighted. The governor of Michigan is trying to close line five. You know, Enbridge has undertaken to rebuild, put it under the, the seabed, do all kinds of things. And in my view, her actions are short-sighted, not only for us, but for her own state. And so these kinds of things make achieving the sorts of goals that we have very, very difficult to get at. So then that begs the question, how well are we trying? So, so let me conclude on, on the, I, I don't have a lot to say on the international scene because as people earlier said, most of our energy exports go to the United States and we are a net exporter. I'm optimistic about that. I believe there's a role for Canada and the gentleman you heard earlier spoke much more eloquently than I ever could about that property and about our obligation. And in the long term, in the long term, we do have a role to play, as do other parts of the world. Um, you know, I often joke when I was, the other thing we did, we looked very hard because we literally were on a day-to-day -day basis with the threat of rolling brownouts in Ontario in the summer of 2005 and 2006. And so we, we had a good, hard look at Mourns, and we basically decided, yep. And I signed all of the agreements on all the ones that are now, are now on stream and are, or coming on stream to refurbish. And make no mistake, refurbishing a nuclear reactor is rebuilding it from the bottom up. It's just, you know, you're building it on the same place, and you don't have to uh, go through the environment. If you have to start from scratch, S 20 years. And I even threw the door open to uh, private companies other than, than, uh, than Canadian companies because the Canadian nuclear sector at the time was not in good shape. And for a while, I think I was almost as popular as Jerry Lewis in France because they wanted to come and build here in Ontario. And Part of that mix is nuclear, and we know the advantage. I applaud the Ford government for moving forward on the SMRs. And in my, my experience, that's where the future is. The problem with nukes is, again, even, even with an SMR, the timeline. God help us if there's a nuclear incident anywhere in the world between the time that new reactor comes online. Why? It'll shut down. Public opinion will get very nervous. We gave up on our ambitions on new nukes after uh, uh, Fukushima. I mean, public opinion just had moved so fast and so far in that period of time. So on the domestic supply, we are transitioning, in my view. We're doing a good job. There's difficult questions. Um, the policy imperatives are clear. And made, they were made more clear this past Monday. And uh, this has to be a global priority. But some solutions and others have said this earlier, some of the things we need, we haven't even invented yet. And there's a question of how long it takes to bring them to market. You know, a whole range of issues of that nature. 
And you know, other decisions we as a people, as a country have made, we have made indigenous reconciliation a priority for this country, quite appropriately, and in a way that we, have to, we should have done many years sooner. But that clearly implies and means you simply can't do things as fast as you would have otherwise liked to. Uh, Ms. Blondin spoke about the indigenous view of time. It's completely different from ours. And it's not something you can force them to change. I mean, there's a lot to be said for their view of long term. But if you're going to make that a priority, you also need to understand that that will make it more difficult. Metogamy was the last great hydroelectric opportunity in Ontario. From the time it was first conceived till the time it went under construction was 25 years. 400 megawatts of hydroelectric. And by the way, Ontario has tapped, there's no more hydroelectric in Ontario. It, we, we started to run out of it in 1960. That's when the Robarts and Davis governments made the move into nuclear. We exceeded our capacity. I laugh, we call it our hydro bill. It's not a hydro bill at all, it's, an, it's a power bill. 51% of that power is coming from nuke. Today, about 25% from hydro. Used to be about 20% of it came from coal. So it, that's part of the cultural challenge you have, is changing people's mindsets and attitudes. And it's not only a question of the mindset and attitude, it's a question of price, and it's also a question about reliability. So as we move to transition to cleaner technologies, Brad addressed this, a number of people touched on it. One of Ontario's great strengths has been the reliability of our power system. So for instance, I don't know how many of you remember the big ice storm back about 20 years ago. All the, all the towers in Quebec got crushed. Very few of them did in Ontario. Why? Quebec had a preferential procurement policy to buy Quebec steel. It wasn't the best. Whereas hydro, Ontario, the old Ontario hydro, always put in the very best of that. Growing up on the border, every time a storm blows through to this day, uh, power's been out in Windsor for three hours, it should be restored in the next two hours. A week later, there's still large swaths of Detroit with no power. That reliability of our system, Jim Balsilli once said to me, he says, I am prepared to pay more as long as I know that the power is getting there and I prefer clean power. And so that is the other aspect of this and in terms of replacing or reducing our reliance on fossil fuels you can't forget any of those. And people do not have bottomless pockets. And as a politician, as a government, you're gonna have to sell people on this. And if you do it right, you'll be successful. I like to think, Brad, we moved the yardsticks a lot, but it was not without a lot of mis number of mistakes by us, um, number of errors on our part, I mean, I told you about, I mean, the coal thing, we just completely underestimated the technical challenge of replacing 4,000 megawatts of one power source with another. Any one of these scientists who spoke earlier would have told you that. And, uh, but we were convinced. <clears throat> Try not to go down until energy supply. So there, there's a breakdown of, of not only our total, and by the way, these I've given you a reference. These are all available. You can pick them up. There's a great document I'd recommend. The IEA put it out, uh, Canada's Energy Policy in, in uh, 2022. I'd highly recommend it to you. But the thing that struck me about it, and this is another thing, and that is what is realistic? You know, politicians will tell you all you have to do is build more wind, more solar, and the reality is we had a very aggressive wind and solar policy in Ontario starting in the, the, the mid part of the first decade of the 21st century. And I think we're at about 4% of installed capacity. And you know, 
I'm not, that's not, by the way, a reason to say we shouldn't be harder. But believe me, when you go into small towns in Ontario and they see windmills coming into their community, you're going you're to hit a buzzsaw. And then there, there are greater challenges with, with solar. This is not, by the way, to say we should take our foot off the gas. We shouldn't. And by the way, the cost has come down. Uh, the efficiency of these things, they now have solar panels that are flexible, you can walk on them. They're very brittle for the longest time, but they're continually getting better. Now, the Chinese are making most of them, so there's a political issue there now as well. But all that being said, you have to be realistic. There's no more hydro. There are little spots here and there. They're not commercial. They're not gonna help us. You got bioenergy, you got nuclear, natural gas, Oil and coal. Now, we're not going to go to coal, and we don't need to. We never did. By the way, that coal plant, the only reason it was built was because the mine closed down in the town, and a fella named Leo Bernier, who was known as King of the North, had that coal plant put there even though it wasn't needed after the local mine closed. And that's why it was low-hanging in terms of getting it off, off the grid. And we did replace... Nanocoke, we did replace Sarnia, particularly with natural gas. Brand new, state-of-the-art natural gas plants that are still working well. I see Gary left. Um, I wanted to be a little bit provocative with him. Um, he's, he, oh, is he, oh, okay, I'll save, the, I'll save the provocative comment till he gets back to, just to, I'd, I'd actually love to hear his on it. And that is the, uh, the, you know, how good is the technology around carbon capture and storage? It, you know, to date, it really doesn't work well. There's lots of pilots going. I remember back in the day, uh, we looked at it. And so number one, you got the problem with capturing it. Then number two, you got a problem with storing it. And in Ontario's case, there's not very many places to store it. Oh, here he is. Gary, I was being provocative. And I wanted you to be in the room when I was being provocative. Carbon capture and storage. Um, we looked very closely at it. And I'm, I'm actually glad to see the federal government and others have invested a lot of money, but it's really not proven yet. And the part of the problem we had in Ontario 10 years ago, and I don't know if this has changed, was the storage. One of the places to store it was under Lake Ontario. So I joked with one of our policy guys, I said, does that mean we're gonna turn the lake into a giant spritzer? And that is an issue. The storage, the big, big plant down in Mississippi was demolished. It was built about 20 years ago, and it just never worked. And so it is a part of the future. There's no doubt. If you look at PCC uh, release the other, the other day, it sees carbon capture as being part of the solution, although it is in terms of the, the technical ability today and the cost, it's, it's lower and from their estimation than other, other things. Again, not to say we shouldn't do it, not to say that we shouldn't be studying it, especially if we're committed um, to, to reducing our carbon footprint. Um, trying to think, it's transition, contest, yes, so, so I spoke about the uh, domestic coal. I've tried to relate to some of the, the, the challenges I've seen from our coal closure policy, the introduction of smart meters, and the Green Energy Act which was very controversial when we brought it in. I, Brad, I think it's fair to say it was the only time I remember having a table where we actually had a fight, like not physical fight, but it was very hotly contested because of assumptions around price and so much. One of my former colleagues, uh, Sean Conway, used to say that energy policy in Ontario is the third rail of Ontario politics. You'll never win an election on it, but you can lose an election on it. And there's a lot of truth to that. So that was very uh, controversial. Wind, solar, I spoke about those. Uh, Mike Schreiner, who was here earlier, I, I looked at the Greens uh, campaign platform, and none of it adds up. And part of the challenge I have with politics today is, and that young man who quoted from President Kennedy's uh, Rice University speech, the most important part, we're, we're doing this not because it's easy, but because it's hard. 
And we as a society have to come to grips with the fact that power is not free. You know, when Adam Beck was building hydro, uh, the old Ontario hydro, there was more power than they could have dreamed of at the time. They kept it in public hands to make sure that everybody had access. And they were very successful. But then, by about 1960, and by the way, there are briefing documents within the Ontario Ministry of Energy and the old Ontario Hydro dating back to the 1960s that said, it may not be worthwhile to meter nuclear power. They thought it was going to be so cheap. And of course, that had borne fruit. Here are greenhouse gas emissions. This, this is why I think you need to be a bit skeptical. So you'll see 2019, the most recent date, where we're at. There's a breakdown on where, you know, where the emissions come from and where, we, where we've been in the last number of years and where we have to get to in 11 years. And then, of course, to, I'm sorry, yeah, to 2030. And, and, and uh, I don't know how you get there. I just don't. And I think we need, and, and sessions like this are compelling us to talk about that. And, you know, I'll say this. We have a lot more in common with Alberta and the energy producing province than I think most Ontarians realize. And to the extent that we, we can transition, not to mention our obligations to the world. Lloyd. Mm -hmm. um, that's not mine, that's the... Uh, okay, that's not yours, that one. Um, what I don't know, because I, I'm ignorant of this issue, is how much our total energy uh, uh, development, like how much oil, gas, and, and electricity we've produced from 1990 to now. Is that, if you had that line up there, in other words, would you be seeing a, a rapid increase in energy output versus a reduction in emissions per energy supply by source in Canada okay. 20, yeah, for the last 20 years. So that other graph, you superimpose the two, you would see that the total energy production is going up Absolutely. rapidly. Absolutely. So we are getting a more efficient production relative to emissions. It's a matter of, of trying to combine the two. Is that accurate, Gary? That's, you get a better position. I that would, is correct. It, yes, it makes <laughs> sense. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I thought I knew I had that on there. Now, I don't know how many of you had a chance to read Bill Gates' book, how to avoid a climate disaster. Um, I've read it three times since it was published. These are his concerns with the goals. Equity. It is very difficult to achieve what we need to achieve in an equitable fashion on a global basis. If we're gonna pay the most, and I would, you, know, you, you spoke very well about this, are poor countries. You know, domestically, when we embarked on conservation, a big conservation, you know, demand-side management, we, you know, if you live in a, a six-bedroom house with a swimming pool and a, a three-car garage, it's easy to conserve. If you're a senior citizen living in a one, uh, one or two-room apartment in downtown Toronto with four light bulbs and a stove, how do you conserve energy? So, and, and you know, you convince yourself as a politician, well, I'm gonna give, I'm, we're gonna let the price go up, but we're gonna give them the tools to conserve their energy. It doesn't work for everybody. That, you know, I spoke a little while ago about the amount of subsidy on energy price we're doing here in Ontario. We actually looked at some form of, you know, income-based subsidy to people. And I think, Brad, it's fair to say our officials said there's just no way we can do that and be fair and ensure that we do that. So equity is a real issue for any politician. I don't care if they're progressive, if they are conservative, that is vital. You know, I, you know in some places, you know, a wealthy person buying a Tesla can get a huge tax cut. Well, that's not going to help somebody, uh, uh, you know, a single mom working at Tim Hortons right, who has to drive a 10-year-old vehicle that's not energy efficient. Innovation investment, 
here Gates, the part that caught me about it, he argues the nuclear technology we're building today, even these SMRs, is essentially the same technology as we used 50 years ago. There's been no innovation. He put together a group of investors. They developed what they believe is a much safer nuke, whether an SMR or a large reactor. They couldn't get anywhere in the world to test it, to build plant. China agreed, and then Donald Trump became president, and you know what happened with the relationship with China, and he, not to mention today, but that technology hasn't changed. It's essentially the same, quite apart from fusion, all these things, and it's gonna take time. I thought the one, the one graph, I forget who put, put it up earlier about you know the, how long it takes to bring a new technology online. Looks like it's shortening over time. That gives us some hope, but you're still talking 20 years. And the kind of political interference that can happen in 20 years, I mean, is in government policy setting. We've, we've talked a lot about this. Governments, on the one hand, try to get you to conserve energy, try to save money on energy, but on the other hand, they remove price incentives, i.e., they subsidize the price of the power. And by the way, that's completely inequitable. Somebody like me, and I assume most of the people in this room, get a nice bit of cash. Again, if you're a senior person in a two-bedroom apartment, not much at all. Behavioral change. This is the one that gets me. A uh, lady raised a question earlier this morning about culture. You know, Ontario is still the highest per capita consumption of electricity in the world. And we have two peaks. We have a summer peak and a winter peak. And it's interesting, a number of the creation me measures we introduced back in the day worked. I mean, our total power consumption is about where it was 20 years ago, but it's now about to take off. It's now about to take off. And so each of us, I'm looking, out, I'm looking around the room. I would love to be a vegetarian. It ain't on. I, I eat more fish. I eat more greens. And, and by the way, the greenhouse industry in Ontario, I don't know if the last time you've been in a greenhouse, you know, the, you know the peppers you buy in the store. 15 years ago, they produced 10 to 15 peppers per plant. Today, it's 54. And it's all computerized. And it's, they don't put them in soil. It's a compost composed of stuff from Thailand and all over the place. And we are now the second largest greenhouse operator of all the nations of the world, second only, interestingly enough, to the Dutch. And what's interesting about that industry is um, we now can light the greenhouse with LEDs in a cost-effective way. The Leamington, which is about 40 kilometers from where I live, you can see the lights. It's become, the light pollution has become a major issue. But greenhouses, by the way, are also carbon sinks. We did some programs. We couldn't quite get them to be, you know, with cogeneration and so on, trigen, cogen. So there's opportunities, there are lots of opportunities. Up in Red Lake, Ontario, Brad, I don't know if you had a chance to get there. It's the, the town's motto is, is um, where the pavement ends, and it literally does. There is a school there that is entirely heated and cooled by geothermal. And that was, I'm um, really dating myself, that was 15 years ago when I was there. Geothermal, there's all kinds of these other technologies. We eventually replaced the plant in Atacokan with, uh, they, they burned the, the, the stuff off the forest floor. Now, the power is not efficient, it's not strong. Got the idea from Denmark. The Danes have a policy where they buy up all the farmer's hay and they burn it to create electricity. So you got farmers benefiting, you got energy consumers. But of course, their price of electricity and their lack of natural resource makes it viable. 
and then making it a priority. You know, Monday I got all upset when I saw the IPCC report. By two, I was, you know, on China and interference in Canadian elections and and I don't know about the rest of you. I try. I really do try. You know, I've, I've done, I've got a composter. I, I've got LEDs through my house. You know, I've done, I, I've got all the low-hanging fruit. But I'm sure my clothes aren't sustainably produced. Because I don't think many people in this room, they are. Uh, you know, I joked about, you know, the, the, um, the agricultural sector and, and methane both in the ag sector and watching them burn off methane. And fortunately, we have seem to be making a lot of stride there. But I think we need to be realistic. We need to acknowledge the challenges, and we need to embrace them. And we need to invest. What we keep this country great and make us an important supplier to the world is our ability to invest, not only in the clean technologies, but the 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 fossil fuel technologies that will enable us to get from here to there. Recognizing, in my view, there will always be, if, if only as a backup, there will always be a need. And we should respect one another. And we should understand the implications of the kind of transition we're looking for. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. I'm cold too. <laughs> Any questions? I guess everybody wants to go home. <laughs> Gary. So uh, you did mention, um, you know, burning hay in order to produce electricity in Denmark. I mean, it does strike me that um, one of the issues in Canada that results in high methane emissions is uh, municipal land. So about 15% of Canada's emissions of methane comes from yeah, pills. So what you do is you, you put in a clay liner that's six feet thick, you put your garbage on top of it, when it's filled up, you put another clay liner on top. Yep. The purpose of which is to show that there's going to be no leaching of material into the aquifer. That doesn't work. And preventing the methane of all the stuff that's percolating in your landfill from escaping into the atmosphere. That doesn't work either. So uh, one of the things that I've seen in the Netherlands that may be worth looking at is they take municipal solid waste, they burn it, they capture the CO2, and they pump it into greenhouses. Now, the ambient, the ambient CO2 in the atmosphere is about 400 parts per million, but in a greenhouse, it's about 1,200 parts per million. And then what they do is they take LED uh, that's set up with solar and they set the LED lighting at the spectrum that is best for whatever plant it is that they're growing. So nightshade tomatoes are different from leafy romaine lettuce. And, and so they're taking their MSW, municipal solid waste, turning it into energy, recovering the CO2, and, and using it to produce food. And the number of hectares under glass in the lens far exceeds per capita any other place in the world. Yep. Yeah, and I think there's, I, I, I wasn't familiar with the, the landfill piece that you added to that. I did, by the way, I was part of our local waste management authority years ago where, where we cited a landfill design just like you said. At the time it was state of the art. That landfill's now ready to close. Um, but we do need to be open to these technologies. And, if, you know, I assume people do look at them, not just governments, but I assume there are others. I mean, based on... The inquiries I still get to this date about technologies and so on and what's going on out there. This is why I say investment is so important um, for our country's continuing status in the world as a, net, as a net energy exporter and hopefully develop the kinds of technologies that will help us get to the goals that are very difficult to achieve. John, I'm sorry. Oh, Tom, go ahead, Tom. Go ahead. One of the, uh, you, you defended uh, in your talk, very interesting talk, the idea of setting stretch goals or ambitious goals. Um, I, I think it, in much of public policy now, we're now seeing people exceeding goals with very little idea about how they're going to be achieved. It's 
So it becomes a shadow. True. Uh, so, and, and nowhere is that better than in the field we've been talking about today, energy and, and the climate change. So easy to put the slogan of clue in it, doing it. So with your experience, Gary's not the same and others, I'm interested in attention to implementation of policies. The, the how to get it done side as opposed to let's, you know, let's set the goal side. Why is it so difficult and what can be done to get realism on how to achieve these goals we all want? But it's <coughs> failure after failure after failure on implementation. Can anything really be done about that? It's even more pronounced when the goals are so ambitious. Yes in my experience, and, and I didn't know it at the time, but I was, with our coal policy, I was a bit of a canary in the coal mine. We were a canary in the coal mine. You know what happens to canaries in mines, right? But what I learned from that experience, and where I, and I've told Catherine McKenna this, I've told Jean, uh, Francois Philippe Champagne this, you've gotta have people following up behind you who are paying attention to the details. And you do have to, in my view, if they've made a mistake, they're not acknowledging the challenges enough. Don't be afraid to say to people, as President Kennedy did, mm -hmm. we're doing this because it's hard. And you know, when you think of the things that came out of the US space program as a result of that, I mean, I, that's where I feel optimism, you know? There's a kid out there someday who's inventing the best battery of all time that'll store power in somewhere. It will happen. And maybe it's an AI machine or something too that does, I don't know. But the point is, our policymakers have got to pay attention to those details. And they gotta make sure there's, let me give you an example that neither Ontario or Canada, so, um, the, the young fellow at the beginning uh, spoke about the Nantes plant in Windsor, okay? It's huge, huge, largest single investment in history. We don't have enough port land to get the critical minerals in and out. And nobody's, they're studying it right now. But remember, this plant's gonna be online in probably two years, maybe three. And and I, again, I don't say this critically. I say it as someone who has lived it. And things you think are simple and should be no-brainers are difficult. And I'm sure it was not easy to convince Canada to take its own flag back in 1964. Right, you know, today, Getting to zero, net zero, in that short a period of time is a fight. Political fight, technological fight, and financial fight. And I think that, uh, but I'm optimistic. And I think that's where the, uh, I, so I think it can happen. One of the problems we have, I'll say this, we have done so much to undermine the public sector in the last 30 years that there's no trust to the public sector. And that's part of the challenge as well. And bigger cultural thing, but that's part of my thing. But I've told, I told Champlain this explicitly. I said, you're the Energizer Bunny. I can't get over your energy and your commitment and what you're doing. Is somebody following up sure that everything that needs to be in place is in place in a timely fashion? So I, I, I hope so. <laughs> but I am optimistic. Now I had John and then this young lady and then you. I said earlier that there's a carrot buffet in the States and there's a big baseball bat in Canada. You talked about the need to invest. What does that actually look like? like what kind of carrots should we try and introduce do you think that in Canada? In terms of investment, how do we yeah. incent it? Um, so yesterday the Ford government announced a, uh, uh, a tax credit. Economists don't like tax credits because historically they don't work. I tend to be on that side. Um, but, you know, we're finally taking, we're finally competing with the 
options in terms of subsidies. And although the new, uh, the new uh, uh, Inflation Act takes it to a whole different level. And I'm not sure, again, how realistic the American plan is. But that being said, in my experience, do not underestimate the Americans, ever, period. And, you know, they got themselves to energy independence a lot quicker than he thought. You can, uh, you can debate the merits of how they did it. You can debate a whole bunch of things. But in my experience, do not, do not underestimate them. And by the way, don't underestimate Canadians, too. Um, we got, you know, we, we got some smart people. We've got, but we do need, and I think the work I'm seeing happening in terms of finance is going to be important. How do we form capital investments about? I'm not expert enough to really talk to that, but I'm confident that I, I'm seeing the things I'd like to see. This young lady, I'm sorry. Um, so in the last couple of years, Canada has, in the last couple of years, Canada has sent across like 2,300 metric tons to the Asian countries to process the waste management. And the fines are up to like somewhere between $400 to $2,000, which is almost nothing to these organizations. So I guess what I'm trying to ask is like, how do we create a self-sustainable system where we are able to manage the waste and process the waste within the country instead of outsourcing it to an Asian country? Because a lot of it kind of gets lost even on the seas, and then it impacts the environment. Toronto had a hard time dealing with its garbage for a long, long time. When, 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 we, when I, we built the landfill, and the, by the way, a new composting facility, the first of its kind, a new recyclery, um, we have to come to terms with that. That's one of those tough decisions. And part of it is changing our habits, reduction. Uh, the three R's, and, but reduction is the most important in my view. And I think, and again, I'm optimistic because we have made progress in that way, haven't we? We're moving away from plastic straws. We're, we've moved away from plastic bags. Mm. And, you know, it took a lot longer, I think, than anybody thought. But I mean, how ma I don't know how many times I've gone to the grocery store and I forgot to bring my reusable bags and I have to take a plastic bag. And what I learned in the early part of the 21st century, in my very limited experience, how difficult it is to get people to change their habits, much less pay for it. And don't underestimate that as a factor in getting to where we want to be. Isn't it a mix of both, like consumer behavior and stringencies? Like, it was so funny to me during the pandemic that Loblaws would like Loblaws employees would wear this t-shirt called Save Oceans and they were literally giving out food in plastic bags. And I'm like, <laughs> that's just contradictory to your own belief. So I feel like the government could do a lot in, in terms of enforcing those stringent policies. I'm not sure how much the government can do, and we have done a lot, but you gotta get people to change their habits. And you gotta get people to, you know there are people in Ontario that put their kids clothes in the dryer before they go out to school in the morning you know, in the winter time. You know, that, that's not, feels great, but you know, until you can't breathe the air anymore, you know, or until, until there's no more winter in Canada. Just one last point. Sure. I feel like this a lot of the it, last point or the yes. last question. Yeah. A lot of it has to do with uh, the perception that your quality of life decreases when you try to bring, bring about some behavioral change. But I feel like it's important to understand that you can still have a minimalistic lifestyle, but also like live a full, uh, I don't know, like a full life. So I feel like this whole perception of reduction in quality of life, as soon as you have to make certain behavioral change, I think move a little bit away from that. I think the opposite is true. Okay. I think, you know, as people, you know, my whole house now is LEDs. When we first started out, we had CFLs. Remember those? Women hated them. Um, they did. Market research showed it because they weren't fair. They didn't put your face in good light in the mirror. We now have adjustable LEDs, all that. And by the way, don't try to buy a light bulb in this day and age because <laughs> you need a PhD in physics, I think, it feels like sometimes. But the point is, we have made progress. We have to understand it takes, a, takes time. 
you had one, this shell had one quick Holy question. Tom says it says it's okay. No, last one, David. Okay, uh, following up on Tom, and, and your comment about following up, um, and this is, I'll, I'm looking at Brad, I'm looking at Gary. Do we have the same quality following up uh, in staffers uh, with ministers today, or has there been a general decline? Surely <laughs> <laughs> a decline from my day. <laughs> <laughs> Brad, do you want to take a shot at that? Hey, it's not so much staffers following up. Uh, it is following up with sensible, well-thought-out, holistic policies. Put these things out from beginning to end. So the idea of the Green Energy Act for us, great idea. Getting off of coal, great idea. Get ahead of the rest of the world, and we were. Good idea. And a good economic idea. Execution. I, I, you know, we got it done, but Dwight and I can go back and I can point to some pretty crazy things we did in execution now that we wouldn't have done before. So execution is key. Thinking through that execution, and that's not a staff thing, that's, that's everybody combined in government, figuring out the best path and, and making sure you get it done in the best possible way. So you need to execute. Gary? Execution. I, I was just going to say this, David. In my observation, good governments spend 75% of their time thinking about telling and executing good public policy and 25% of their time retail marketing the same. Many governments in Canada have that proportion in reverse. And they, spend, they think that issuing the press release is action. And issuing a press release is not action. It's a statement of intent, but without follow-up, Amounts to nothing. So, well, that, uh, happy <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you. One of you guys gave me that. Thank you. So, on behalf of uh, the Monk School of Massey College, I want to thank, thank Dwight Duncan for that excellent uh, keynote. Uh, I want to thank all of the panelists uh, for a very stimulating day. I want to end as I began uh, by students from Massey and Monk who really put together an extraordinary day and uh, we're we're in their we're in their debt so and thanks for the audience and the very attentive uh, and useful questions um, we will resume the public policy program here at Massey next September September 20th uh, the need for a national water policy and, uh, and we will continue that through the rest of the year, so you'll all be invited to that. And stay, if there's one overarching message from today, it's that we have to be realistic, don't fool yourself, don't fool others, but stay hopeful. <laughs> yeah.